Today, I have the, the great pleasure of uh, speaking to Michelle Hill, who is a consultant psychiatrist uh, in the student health services uh, in University College Cork. And she's the chair uh, of the Faculty of Youth and Student Psychiatry um, in the Irish College of Psychiatry. Um, it's great to talk to you, uh, Michelle. Um, as you probably know, um, one of the platforms I'm running on uh, as a candidate for the Shannad is to um, significantly improve and expand the mental health services um, that are available uh, to Irish people. Uh, you know, obviously with a particular focus on on the mental health of young people whom I believe have suffered greatly um, over the last two, two years. So that what I wanted to ask you first was, um, it, in your practice and in your experience, are you seeing, uh, as it were, what some mental health professionals have, have, have said is, an alarming uh, crisis that is that has built in in uh, mental health, um, uh, and uh, the fear expressed by by me and and many others that um, that the services just are are going to be overwhelmed by by uh, the the people who need them. Yeah, absolutely, Maureen. I'm I'm delighted that you're taking such an interest in the mental health services um, for people in this country, in particular young people. Um, and on the ground, day to day, uh, we've never been busier in student health than we have been in terms of mental health uh, in recent times. You know, and I think. Um, uh, as you said already, young people are particularly impacted by COVID. You know, they were very impacted by the social restrictions and the phase in life that it interrupted has had a huge impact on them. And they weren't as likely to be impacted by the physical um, implications of COVID. So it seems particularly unfair. But not only that, it's such a crucial stage of brain development. And it is the stage uh, of, uh, you know, 75% of young people are likely to uh, Seventy-five percent of people who develop a mental illness over the course of their lifetime develop it before the age of twenty-five. So it is the age of onset, anyway, of mental illness. And before COVID ever happened, I think the services were struggling to cope with the demand of young people looking for support. And now, with COVID on top of that, it's kind of pushed the demand even further. So it's not um, it's not alarmist at all what the press is saying about mental health services being stretched to capacity. And, and the, the people you're describing, um, Michelle, are, are people who are in an acute, uh, an acute uh, um, uh, state of distress, and and maybe many of them, have, you know, had existing vulnerabilities, um, uh, which have been exacerbated um, by by uh, the, the the social restrictions, the lockdowns. Um, the isolation, uh, all of those things. But um, are, are, are you, are there other people presenting now that in normal circumstances wouldn't be turning up uh, at your office? Uh, I would say so. Um, because I'm a psychiatrist, obviously, I tend to deal with people, as you said, who have greater degrees of distress or um, symptoms uh, really are the emergence of a mental health problem and our service is much busier dealing with um, people who have developed eating disorders during the pandemic who are really struggling with their executive function the ability to kind of get through the day-to-day -day routine to focus on their studies etc and wondering if they have um, ADHD we've higher levels of presentations of self-harm and crisis in the university setting and my understanding is that the counselling services in the university setting also have much higher levels of presentations of you know acute Acute anxiety, general stress, um, and trauma, I suppose, the legacy of trauma from having had such a difficult experience with COVID. Hmm. So, so there, there's almost like, uh, I suppose, a, a ladder uh, of risk, you know, um, there, there are those that would have been sort of always maybe in need of occasional um, uh, extra support from the 
mental health services, but are now, uh, as it were, acutely uh, in need. There are those that 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 are presenting, as you say, with with a range of behavioral difficulties or anxiety, depression. Um, and, and then there are all of those those people um, who uh, uh, who would never have darkened your your door before. And, and I suppose what, I, what I'm asking really is, is what will happen if, say, take the second group, you know, the, the group, the eating disorders, the depression, the anxieties, if, if they're not uh, dealt with now, you know, um, but what what what's the likelihood? What's the prognosis? Yeah, well, mental health conditions are no different really to physical health conditions and really early intervention is much more likely to be a cost effective approach to treatment and also much more likely to work and um, get in early before these symptoms become entrenched. Um, things like eating disorders don't tend to just disappear by themselves. They usually require specialist intervention. And obviously, if you get in before the behavior, as you said, um, becomes more habitual and entrenched in the person, you're much more likely to have good response. So really, it's... It, when you say what will happen if they're not dealt with, well, what will happen is that people who could have been helped if they had access to an appropriate service early in the onset of their condition um, don't get help. Well, they're more likely to be more difficult to treat in the first place and more likely to develop a more chronic um, unremitting course of the condition. And, and what's your sense of, we say, the bottom of the ladder of risk and and these are but still on a ladder um they, these are people who uh, uh, again you know they're they're managing you know they're they're sort of coping at some level but but what kind of at what cost to to themselves you know um if somebody is under par you know uh, if somebody is is just less confident than they used to be, uh, more fatigued, um, more irritable, you know, that, that sort of range of things that can often be ignored, you know, um, but, but, are, but are now persisting beyond what they might before. Um, that, what are the kind of services they need, you know? Um, and, and, you know, because they can become entrenched as well, can't they? Yeah, exactly. Well, I think, um, first of all, there needs to be a greater level of awareness of what a person can do to help themselves to flourish in their day to day life and um, a validation that all of us are experiencing an impact of our mental well-being at this moment in time and um, with some practical tips as to what one might do for themselves. But beyond that, I think there needs to be more social interventions around that. So, for example, in the university setting, it's not necessarily about getting more and more staff on site with clinical expertise for those kind of people, but it's much more about having, say, um, an induction program into the university yeah. setting, setting people up with peer support networks and really facilitating them engaging in university life and clubs and societies now that we're reopening society. So um, I'm not sure if that answers your question effectively. But no, it's it, it, yeah. it, it does. And, and it sort of raises uh, a, a, another issue, which is that uh, is, is that it really is that transition points that that things are in flux, you know, when, you know, you, is, you know, after maybe a stumbling start, you know, of coming out of the little cosy world of national school, you know, you, you finally get some kind of a peer group together and, you know, uh, and get your life together. Um, and then just as you have all that, you, you suddenly have the transition to university. And of course, for except for those who, who live in a university city, it also means uh, leaving home, um, leaving your old friends, leaving that almost invisible network of, of support. You only really notice it when it's gone, you know? Um, um, and, and how adequate do you believe introductory programs are, you know, um, onboarding um, programs for new students? How 
how how comprehensively do they cover that so that they they sort of they give the message you know this transition is is stressful for most people it's normative you know to feel a bit overwhelmed yeah well i think it it's different in every institution but i think there's something about timing that often seems to be an issue as well it's very overwhelming uh, students tend to describe information overload when they arrive oh. into the university so they're given timetables that may be difficult to navigate and getting across campus um, and they're also given a lot of information about what services are available what clubs are available and um, and then it's almost about repeating those onboarding um, exercises yeah. at intervals throughout the year because the student may not recognize they have any need for that at that particular point in time and they'll just tune it out whereas you know come November when they've had a month or two under their belts they might benefit from having access exactly. to the information yeah. again. No, but that's a that's a, a very good point so they need constant reminders you know uh, that that we're still here um, yeah. you know uh, yeah. and and you know I don't know whether there's a walk-in service, but but even that sense that you know it's not a big deal, you know, to to drop in and say, you know, what's the possibility of talking to someone over the next couple of days, you know, uh, etc. And um, a little bit of education to students yeah. as to what's the difference between a normative reaction to yeah. a new setting and what could be the signs of an emerging mental health condition like poor sleep yeah. or a decrease yeah. in their self-care or increased levels of anxiety yeah. so that they really know when they should go looking for help. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And, I mean, and it is the case, isn't it, that yeah. something like uh, the breakup of a relationship which, you know, which is always a bit of a heartbreak unless you have someone fantastic waiting around for you um but but it's always a heartbreak for at least one party um uh and it, it, they, they sort of uh, getting a, it, it, and how it happens that that's what what might be something that would make you kind of sad and upset for a few weeks turns into something else because it often evokes old traumas you know losses early in life um you know the loss of a parent or or um you know a, a, a sort of a you know a, a difficult a difficult set of circumstances when you were growing up Absolutely. I mean, that's something we would see a lot in student mental health services and in student counselling services where the, the, the presenting issue is um, there's a lot underneath it, I guess, that needs more support than may have met the eye at the beginning. I think really what we see in youth mental health is that there's under um, under recognition in ways of the, you know, amount even though there's huge improvement in self-awareness in this country and a huge improvement in stigma that actually we don't have enough to respond to the amount of need that there is on the ground and really what it's about is trying to create some kind of support structure or framework around um you know a university for instance where students are able to access the right care at the right place at the right time so that as you said people at the lowest ladder of the risk as you described it so people whose well-being has been impacted um, know what measures are available and um, have more access to social interventions that could be available but also know when to look for help and are able to get it quite quickly yeah. and then people with higher level needs that there's a university that there's a system response that's able to either help them access care internally or else externally with good partnerships with you know. and, and and surely it's important as well that we get across the message that there's a as in everything a continuum you know in yeah. psychological well-being um and and that you know even if you are in a temporary crisis you know um that that if you can develop over the course of counseling or therapy uh, a sort of a new perspective on yourself uh, a new perspective on your relationships you, you often come out of these kind of sessions just much more interested in yourself, much more um, sort of in awe, really, that, that, you know, you've got through all this and you're still standing, you know, and it gives you much more compassion for other people. So it, it's sort of more than just fixing people. It, it's, it's giving people that, that sort of enhanced 
sense about themselves and 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 their and their only and their one and only life yeah exactly and compassion for others starts with self-compassion of course yeah, and then yeah. giving people that emotional agility to navigate the inevitable ups and downs in life and obviously they're being exposed to that uh for the first time on their own really in the university that's so right yeah. but that you know they're going to be doing that for the rest of their lives yeah yeah and and i mean obviously the you know we've we've talked mainly about the university sector but of course you know uh, people aren't always in university uh, and they're going to go out into the wider world you know in a couple of years and and even during the holidays you know um the, they 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 take up jobs and you know they may have to emigrate to make money and and all of of that kind of stuff so so uh, what i wanted to ask you about is just um for for people in ireland well from all over the 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 place um what is the state of uh of the mental health services ar around the country yeah well i mean I think there's there's significant underfunding um, in the sector across the board, and they're not adequately resourced to provide the service that I think they're qualified to provide. I think there's a very competent workforce um, in mental health in Ireland. The training standards are very high across all the different um, professionals in the field, all the different disciplines. But the truth is there's just not enough of them. There's not enough people trained um, in the country and then there's not enough people employed across these teams. So that has a massive knock on effect for the person who's trying to access help. It means that services have to um, manage the capacity, manage the waiting lists, and they can end up setting too high a bar for access to secondary care, in my opinion, as somebody who's in the primary care sector and sees the kinds of young people who um, might attend an A&E department, for instance, but not actually access secondary care through that forum and be sent back to primary care. And really their needs are beyond primary care, but they're not kind of severe and entrenched enough to get through the bar of what's required to access secondary care. So I think, unfortunately, um, the services are quite disjointed and um, there, there's significant gaps between primary and secondary care, there's significant gaps between the education and the health sector. And then some teams are better resourced than others and generally the teams with the, you know, the higher level of resources provide what everybody wants to provide, which is a multidisciplinary structure of support for whoever presents to them, but it's just not always possible. But, but, but there are two things, though, uh, two questions that arise from that. One is uh, the, the government recently announced uh, what they billed as very significant uh, funding uh, for the mental health service. Um, do you think it's fit for purpose? Well, my understanding is that um, the mental health budget in this country is 6% of the health budget, which is half of most other European countries spend on mental health. So um, to me, I don't have the sense that this funding um, has made its way <laughs> to the ground and in a, to fully staff teams on the ground. And, and the other issue is, you know, as came up in the CAMS report, you know, the, the HSE, uh, uh, you know, referred to the fact that they had great difficulty filling uh, senior posts uh, in, in the area. And, and I suspect, of course, that, that uh, uh, outside of university cities um, uh, and very big urban centers, that that's probably replicated all over the country. And, and why are they having such trouble recruiting people? Well, I think, um, you know, when you qualify and go through the amount of training that you have to go through in any of the professions, but I, I'll speak for my own as a psychiatrist, it's usually 10 years post-medical training by the time you're qualified to be a consultant psychiatrist and to lead a multidisciplinary team. And... 
after that amount of training, you want to be able to run a really effective um, service and deliver high standard and quality of care. Mm -hmm. And um, some teams are more staffed than others. And often the best the, the, the teams with the highest numbers of spaces filled tend to be in these, you know, you know, centers of excellence or big cities. So I think it tends to be the case that people would go to those centers for their long term jobs. So, so essentially, there has to be the, the human infrastructure, uh, as well as the physical infrastructure and the funding uh, as part uh, of, of the some a part of the, the package that will attract the kind of people who could lead um, a, a revival uh, and rejuvenation of, of the mental health services uh, in areas that are now sadly lacking them. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think you've really grasped that concept. You, you can see where the issues lie. Right, well, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, uh, that was uh, very illuminating and, and coming from someone whose job it is day to day to, to deal with uh, these issues, which we are referring to in the abstract, but which can make or break uh, people's lives um, is, is a real privilege. Thanks.